Patches for rotated cuff tears featuring the superior capsule reconstruction. Rotated cuff tears are an increasingly common problem, particularly in ageing population, and this has led to an increase in rotated cuff surgery. But despite this, we still have failure rates varying from 10 to 90%. There are three reasons why rotated cuff repairs fail. They can be due to implant failure, due to surgical technique, or due to the biology. Over the past 20 years, we've addressed a lot of these problems, and so a current optimal repair uses implants that have got a better design and don't fail, surgical techniques so that we can obtain a tensionless repair, but despite this, we're still having problems with cuff failure. So the issues aren't with the implants, they aren't to do with the surgical technique, they're to do with the biology. So if we're going to move forward with regards to successful rotated cuff repairs, we need to look for a biological solution. Whilst we can address the mechanical side for rotated cuff repairs, we need to find a way to implement biological solutions, and rotator cuff patches provide this gateway. What do patches do? They can provide mechanical augmentation, they can act as a tendon replacement or as an interposition graft, they provide a scaffold of biological healing such as exceeding stem cells and growth factors, and they can improve the rate and quality of biological healing. How do they do that? Or what are the ideal properties of a patch? They are a scaffold that can rapidly attach the stump of the rotator cuff and surrounding tissues. They can attach firmly to the bone. They can attract and support appropriate cells and they should be biodegradable. The use of patches is in its infancy and currently they're used in two areas. For augmentation, this is to augment repairable tears, giving structural support and potentially enhancing the healing. Or as an interposition, this is for irreparable tears and probably work as a uh, system by which we can recreate the coronal force couple to allow superior elevation in the deltoid to work. Cuff patches can be divided into two types, synthetics or extracellular matrices. And extracellular matrices can either be a xenograft or an allograft, and xenograft materials that we're using are uh, porcine, bovine or equine. These are the current patches that are on the market and as you can see most of them are dermal patches. Uh, there are two that are currently produced that are made out of human but the rest are either porcine or bovine. However these patches are not perfect, they're not uh, tenderness material so they've got poor mechanical properties with a different elastic moduli. Uh, they're not particularly strong so they've got poor suture retention and despite every effort there are still DNA traces and there have been reports of adverse inflammatory responses and there is the potential of disease transmission. Aligned electrospun scaffolds are an exciting area of development and research. These are tissue engineered polymer scaffolds. They're synthetic, biodegradable and biomimetic so they can mimic the uh, orientation of the collagen fibrils so that they are very good to seed stem cells and growth factors. Electrospun scaffolds are made by producing a polymer based synthetic collagen fiber which, uh, as it is laid down, is done so in an electric field, aligning the fibres in the desired position. The fibres in the scaffolds are aligned to mimic uh, normal tendons, so that when they're seeded with uh, human adipose-derived stem cells, they are able to support and produce uh, collagen-like material. Whilst these electrospun scaffolds are an exciting proposition, uh, currently they're not able to be used uh, for uh, human practice. So currently we are using extracellular matrix patches. As mentioned earlier, they are used in two scenarios. One is a scaffold augmentation. So this is for repairable rotator cuff tears. And they may be able to reduce the re-tears by offloading the repair. And they may intrinsically provide a benefit to healing. So they can improve the initial failure, failure load, but not the stiffness. And it's estimated that they're able to take about 30% of the load, so offload the tendon by 30% at time zero. They tend to be used for repairable large or massive two tendon tears in physiologically young patients. Although the tendon quality is poor, it's important that the muscle quality is good, so they're not really used for people with Gatelier 3 or definitely Gatelier 4 muscle wasting. So for the surgical technique, most people are using human dermal extracellular matrices. This can be done as an open or arthroscopic procedure. Um, meticulous suture management is required. There can be some issues delivering in the graft, particularly arthroscopically, and there are some issues with regards to fixation. 
the operative technique generally involves a second or third generation double row technique with the tendon being held by the medial row suture and then the tails of the suture being brought over to create the second row fixing the tendon in position. However I personally have some concerns with regards to this because the only bit of the tendon that's uh, actually attached to the graft is the medial row. I generally try to get a greater fixation of the patch onto the tendon. We'll have at least uh, one more uh, medial suture and in certain situations a, a second row of this stop. I believe that this will help to uh, better offload the load on the tendon. Patches are being used in the armamentaria of treating irreparable rotator cuff tears, the options being a debridement, a tenotomy or suprascapular nerve ablation, the orthospace balloon, a partial repair, interposition graft using the graft jacket, a lat dorsi transfer or a reverse arthroplasty. The graft jacket technique is a true interposition and there are some concerns with regards to whether the tendon is really going to be strong enough and people now feel that uh, this generally works as a, a tenodesis rather than actually replacing the tendon. The superior capsule reconstruction technique was devised by a Japanese surgeon, Dr. Mahata, over 10 years ago. At that time, reverse anatomy arthroplasties weren't available in Japan. He used a fasciolata graft to reconstruct the joint capsule. Japan still has no access to allograft material. He published the biomechanical results of his work in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery in 2012 and showed some uh, strong evidence that the superior capsule reconstruction was able to recreate the coracohumeral uh, distance of a normal tendon. In 2013 he published his clinical results in the Journal of Arthroscopy. He described the results of 24 patients with a minimum of two year follow up. They'd all had a superior capsule reconstruction using an autograph fasciolata. At follow-up, the acromial humeral distance had increased from a preoperative average of 4.6 mm to 8.7 mm, and the ASES score had risen from 23.5 to 92.9. 20 of the patients, so 83.3%, had had no graft tear or tendon retear. His theory with regards to the success of superior capsule reconstruction is that it helps reduce superior translation and so centers the humeral head onto the glenoid. This allows the deltoid to then function properly. Currently there is a mistaken conception uh, with uh, some people and surgeons that superior capsule reconstruction actually reconstructs the rotator cuff. It doesn't. This is a picture from his uh, study showing the fasciolata graph sitting between infraspinatus posteriorly and subscapularis anteriorly. So what's missing from this is the supraspinatus tendon. So this reconstruction just reconstructs the superior capsule. It does not reconstruct the supraspinatus tendon. A hardest technique uses a fasciolata graft. This has the advantage of being an autograft, but it does have a donor site morbidity of both an incision scar and muscle herniation. Whilst this seems to be acceptable to the Japanese population, this is less so to other countries. For other surgeons to take advantage of the results of the superior capsule reconstruction outside of Japan, a different graft source has been required, and so extracellular patches are being used. These have the advantage of being an allograft, but the standard patch, such as the graft jacket, has issues with its strength. Most dermal grafts are 1.5 or 2 mm in width. Arthrex have produced an Arthroflex graft which is 3.5 mm in width and so far stronger. Using the Instrom machine, a double loaded fascia lata fails at 180 newtons, whilst the Arthroflex graft at 3.5 mm doesn't actually fail, it's the bone blocks that fall apart. So the failure here was 550 newtons. So it certainly appears that the Arthrex Arthroflex graft is stronger than the fascia lata, and this is what is generally used to perform a superior capsule reconstruction. This is an animation of um, irreparable tear in a right shoulder. Initially the superior edge of the glenoid is decorticated, and then the greater tuberosity is also decorticated, and microfracture is used to encourage stem cell healing. 
two rotator cuff anchors are then placed either side of the decorticated bone on the glenoid and two medial row anchors are placed into the footprint. The distance between the anchors from the glenoid to the rotator cuff are then measured and the width between the anchors are measured. Having taken these measurements, the graft is then cut to size. It's important that the graft is the exact size, as if it's too tight, uh, it won't fit. If it's too slack, the tension will not be created properly. The sutures from the rotator cuff anchors are then exteriorized and passed through the graft, and similarly the sutures from the glenoid are then passed through the graft. Using a suture pulley technique, the graft is then guided into position the sutures on the glenoid side are then tied in position, securing the glenoid side, and then a speed bridge double row repair is uh, done to fix the graft on the rotator cuff side, so onto the humeral head. Importantly, the posterior edge of the graft is attached to infraspinatus. This is probably the most important part of the technique to recreate the, derm to recreate the force couple. This is the basic video. Most surgeons that are undertaking this on a regular basis have uh, developed their own adaptations. He had a minimum follow-up of 35 months. All of the patients had a significant improvement in their ASCS score. He had graft healing of 98%, 96% and 87% in the no, moderate and severe pseudoparalysis group and had reversal of the pseudoparalysis in 96% of the patients who had a some pseudoparalysis and 93% of the patients who had a complete pseudoparalysis he had two failures with graft re tears. The only study of an allografts SCR was produced by Hirohara in 2017. He looked at nine patients with a minimum follow-up of two years. Their ASES average score rose from 43.5 to 86 and the visual analog score for pain from 6.25 to 0.38. The average acromial humeral height uh, improved from 4.5 millimeters to 7.6 millimeters. He had one failure which was treated with a reverse anatomy joint replacement. So in conclusion, rotator cuff patches are the gateway to biological cuff repairs. They're currently used mainly for their mechanical properties, so for augmentation or interposition. The human dermal allograft appears to have the best performance uh, of those grafts currently available. However, the future is electrospun scaffolds seeded with stem cells and growth factors. If you've enjoyed this talk and would like to know more about cuff patches or any other aspects of shoulder surgery, you may wish to visit my website www.cambridgeshoulder.co.uk. You may also wish to visit my YouTube channel, Cambridge Shoulder, which has over 40 instructional videos of all aspects of shoulder surgery.